on Fat Bear Tuesday, we conclude another Titanic Fat Bear week. The merely chubby have been winnowed away while the two Fat Bear finalists stood firm. Their mass was too great for the gale of competition. They are quintessential examples of success, adaptation, and survival in the bear world. This is Mike Fitz, your resident naturalist with explore.org, and welcome to Fat Bear Tuesday 2022. Joining me are my co-hosts, Katmai National Park Rangers, Kim Grossman, Leon Law, and Chris Kleesrath. Rangers, thanks so much for joining me today, and uh, congratulations on another successful Fat Bear Week campaign. Yeah, happy Fat Bear Tuesday, everyone. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, thank you for having us. If you have questions about Fat Bear Week, Salmon, or Katmai National Park, there are two other rangers patrolling the comments right now. Ranger Keith is in the YouTube comments, and Ranger Felicia is watching the comments on explore.org. So you can post questions there, and they'll do their best to try to answer. We're not going to answer any live on camera, however. We're here, of course, to talk about a lot of things, though. we got a lot on the agenda. We're here to talk about the two fattest bears on Brooks River this year, as chosen by the public as well as the, those bears' journeys to achieve such great success. We'll also take a close look at what fat means to the two finalists, what is in store for them as they enter winter hibernation. And we'll see what range, other rangers think about Katmai's bears. So we have some short videos to share with you about that. Fat Bear Week voters have also asked us how they can support Katmai National Park. We have an exciting announcement about a fundraiser uh, on, on that vein. So stay tuned for more information about that at the end of the broadcast. And if you want more motivation to watch the whole event today, we're also giving away some extra special 10th anniversary bear cam mugs. I have an example here right in front of me. So featuring Otis, but you can probably choose another bear if you want to. Uh, to have an opportunity to get them, we want to know which Brooks River bear you are most like and why. So drop a comment and a short, and I emphasize short explanation um, in the chat. You can take your time with this. We'll draw a few names at random from people commenting on both Explore.org and YouTube. We'll announce the winners at the end of the broadcast. We're coming to the end of Fat Bear Week, of course. Uh, so Leon, I think this is just a great time to recap uh, the event itself and what has happened so far. Absolutely. So. Fat Bear Week is first and foremost a celebration of success. It celebrates all of our bears and the hard work they have done to get ready for the winter ahead. And it's a way to highlight the resiliency, adaptability, and strength of Katmai's brown bears, while also focusing on Katmai's ecosystem overall, one with the healthiest runs of sockeye salmon left on the planet. And during Fat Bear Week, we host a bracket style competition that celebrates a successful summer of weight gain for Katmai's bears. And bears are matched up against each other in a single elimination tournament over the course of a week where people get to vote who advances and ultimately crown the Fat Bear Week champion. And Fat Bear Week is a celebration like we've been talking about. And there are so many things that we love about Fat Bear Week. And to highlight this, we have put together a quick video for some rangers talking about their favorite thing about Fat Bear Week for you to enjoy. This is my favorite part of Fat Bear Week is everyone can get involved. You don't have to be uh, American. All you, have to be, all you have to be is uh, a human. There's so much enthusiasm and and happiness and just gives us an opportunity to share uh, all our facts about the bears. My favorite part of Fat Bear Week is probably the comparison photos. Um, the side-by-sides really illustrate just how transformative it is for them over the summer and it's hilarious. <laughs> My favorite part of Fat Bear Week is watching the cubs get super fat and fluffy. Fat Bear Week allows people from all over the world to tune in to Brooks Falls or the Brooks River, um, this tiny little part of Katmai National Park and brings people together. I think the outreach, the awareness, just how many people talk about Katmai and know I work here so ask me about it and just seeing it in the news, the place you work and love is pretty cool. 
my favorite part of Bear Week is definitely just how light bulb shaped all of the bears are. Favorite part about Fat Bear Week? Yeah, highlighting and celebrating the fatness of the Bears of Brooks River. It is great to be able to share this important resource and talk about how important it is to preserve places like Katmai that have clean water and healthy ecosystems. I think it's neat that everybody all over the world is getting into boating on and viewing all these bears that have spent all summer eating hundreds of salmon to get fat and survive the winter and everyone around the world is enjoying it and that's really cool. Uh, probably all the transformation photos. I don't know how our media team does it but it's really cool to watch. My favorite part of Fat Bear Week is seeing how fans respond. People are so creative with their campaign posters or their playlists or including it in their bracket office parties. I love seeing how people are so invested in these bears and this competition. And so now, um, Mike, we've heard from the Rangers, but as someone who was there from the beginning, I'm sure you must also have a favorite thing about Fat Bear Week. I... Looks like we probably there. have, oh. Oh, did you lose me for a second? Mike, you got to repeat that. We lost you. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I think uh, for me, it's it's the, the debate uh, between people when they're trying to decide which bear to vote for. I love to see people campaigning for their fat bear candidate. So yeah, that's, that's definitely it for me. And of uh, course, uh, you know, Fat Bear Week is not over, um, Chris. So, you know, we we're, I don't think we need to give away, you know, the vote totals right now, but there's still more than an hour and a half left to vote. So if people still want to vote in February week, how can they do that? It's easy to vote and make your voice heard in this mega matchup today. Um, every vote counts. And so you want your vote to matter. It's time to get it in. And you need to go to www.fatbearweek.org and make your selection. Uh, like I said, we need to make the most of Fat Bear Tuesday by submitting your vote before 9 p.m. Eastern time. Awesome. And as we get started, um, as we finish up the voting for this week, let's take a look back on, you know, how did we end up here? Um, how did our bears do along the way? This week, you know, has been an opportunity for us to showcase just not only some of our fattest cat my brown bears, but also to exemplify the adaptability that these bears exhibit as they face these continuous obstacles. So as we started off Fat Bear Week earlier this, um, about a week ago, <laughs> um, we started off with a double hitter and we pitted off um, our youngest bears, 164 against 335. And we also had the most dominant bears against each other, 747 against 856. 164's creative tactics ended up washing out the curious 335, while the large and in charge, 747, ended up dominating 856. And then the next round we had in Fat Bear Week consisted of another double feature, um, 854 versus 151. Two bears who have shown great resilience in the face of both you know, human and bear obstacles out there. And we also had 901 versus 909 Junior, both debuting for the first times in Fat Bear Week um, with their huge percentages of body fat gains. Um, eventually, 151's light bulb shaped body and 901's bulky um, body also won your votes out there. On the third day of Fat Bear Week, we did see the innovative 164 go up against 435 Holly. But he did fall short to her, her rolling stature. And 32, who prioritized reproduction more in the beginning of the season, saw his loss to the gigantic 747, um, who's you know arguably one of the most um, large bears out there on the river. And then this Saturday, we did see 128's um, hard work feeding both herself and her cubs payoff as she triumphed over 151. And we saw the four-time champ and beloved bear, Otis, relinquish his place on the bracket to our up-and-comer, 901. And then, in one of our toughest semifinals yet in Fat Bear Week history, we saw former 
champion pitted up against four champion, where a seven four seven came out on top, defeating four three five Holly. And in the battle of our two assertive styles in the competition, 909, um, she ended up continuing to climb the bracket, surpassing one teammate to the next round and securing her place in today's finals, which leads us to today, where it all comes down to this. We have 747 against 901. So we saw many incredible storylines unfold over the summer. We saw successes. We saw even tough realities of challenges that bears face. And we saw some of the quieter moments out there as well between family groups and just, you know, bears enjoying themselves being playful out there on the river. Uh, so we did ask the number of rangers what some of their favorite bear moments were here in Katmai this summer. And this is what they had to say. So this morning there was a bear sleeping right by the visitor center sign and there's this collection of moose antlers and she was just laying with her face cradled in an antler and it was magical. Favorite bear moment of the season, uh, probably watching 910's cub growl in Grazer's face. Yeah, I was standing on the Ripples platform with some visitors and 402 and her two spring cubs were down below and I watched the two of them holding paws. And it was the cutest moment I've ever seen. I was at the treehouse and I looked over and Grazer, 128, was nursing her cubs right next to the treehouse. It was awesome just to be able to see her taking care of her cubs and uh, watching the cubs thrive. I watched 335 play with 909's yearling right below the bridge. So they were playing underneath the viewing platform there and that was really fun and unique to watch as 909 didn't care that her cub was playing with a little sub-adult. My favorite moment was when my mom visited and we had our first kind of like bear encounter, which is a very normal thing here, but for someone who's never seen a brown bear, at least never that close, it was just like the most mind blowing experience. Um, so it's cool to have that perspective. I love seeing bears do things that I haven't seen before, like catch gulls. And I love seeing bears dive, I love seeing bears play, and I especially love seeing adult bears play too. And of course, anything with cubs is always a cute moment. Oh, um, probably my first night camping in the back country. I woke up to a bear munching on grass right next to my head outside of the bear fence, and it seemed a lot closer than it actually was. One of my favorite bear moments was when I was paddling during the Savanoski Loop. It's an 80 mile paddle trip that takes you through the Savanoski River and there are tons of brown bears along the river. So getting to see wild bears outside of Brooks Camp and how differently they behave was such a really cool and special moment for me. When we were walking one day, we saw a sow with her cubs and one of those cubs stood up on his back legs and went up against the tree and scratched his back and did a little dance for us. The most adorable thing ever. This summer we got to see 909 and 910's family reconnect. And this is something that's not often seen in the bear world. So I feel like any interaction that I saw between their cubs, these sisters, all of these were just incredible moments. All of the moments are my favorite bear moments. <laughs> Uh, so those were just a couple of our favorite moments from the summer, but Mike, I'm sure you probably have a ton of them as well. Would you like to share any of your favorite beer moments? Well, I have to agree with you, Kim. I think the relationship between 909 and 910 this year was sort of exceptional. I had never seen two mother bears associate with each other so closely for so long. And it's not like they were just kind of like near each other. As you can see here, they were playing, they were playing with each other's cubs. They were letting each other's cubs scavenge food off of one another. I mean, it was, it was an amazing thing to see. Uh, and it showed a different side of brown bears compared to what their, you know, normal reputation as like solitary animals, you know, we, we would expect to see at least from that. So yeah, I think that was my favorite bear moment of the year so far. Uh, in February week, of course, like the event itself, that's always a favorite moment of mine too. We haven't really talked too much about the the finalists in Fat Bear Week and the importance of fat to their lives. So we still got two bears standing in Fat Bear Week. Let's start with uh, the giant 747 Leon. What does fat mean to his 
overall survival and health. Sure. When talking about 747, you know, perhaps no ID number is more fitting for a bear of his size. Uh, but as a younger bear, no one could have predicted he would grow so well into his name. And he was first identified as a subadult in 2004, but he sure has come a long way since then. And it's amazing to imagine that when cubs are born in the den in the middle of winter, they weigh a mere pound. And that tiny cub could grow into the largest known bear to use Brooks River, and perhaps one of the largest brown bears on earth, weighing in at an estimated 1,400 pounds or so. And due to his large size and assertive disposition, he has ascended to the top of the hierarchy at Brooks Falls with greater access to the best fishing spots and mating opportunities compared to less dominant bears. And unlike many bears, 747 size alone is usually enough to intimidate most other bears to yield their space upon his approach. His dominance combined with his fishing skills, that really allows him to build up substantial fat reserves for the winter. And even in early summer, when I first see this bear, you know, he is large and he still carries the weight of his previous successes. And he has been a contender in every Fat Bear Week since these matchups since 2014. And he finally did earn that a well-deserved crown in 2020. I'm sure, Mike, that makes you very happy um, after that 32 chunk showdown. Um, but he has some tough competition this year with new bear on the bracket block 901. Uh, so Chris, what can you tell us about 901? Well, while she's made her presence known for sure on the river this year, when she arrived in the spring, she was rather small and had a very light coat. Um, as anyone can tell you, she was pursued by several uh, of the more dominant males uh, courting through camp and um, getting her exercise. Uh, but finally, she was able to put the feeding priority over breeding and start to put on some weight. Um, She's proven to be a force to be reckoned with. She's feisty, independent, and uh, tenacious. Nine and one and her curious nature um, have really been a challenge for the Rangers as they tried to keep her out of camp. Um, she often showed up uh, when she was being courted right through the middle of camp. So she's, she's definitely a feisty bear. Um, she is also one of the youngest bears or the youngest bear to make it to the finals. She's only about six and has done a terrific job of putting on her weight. Um, she, it's necessary for her if you think about it because she's uh, been courted by several males and if we're lucky, she may actually show up with some cubs in the spring. But in order to do that, she's gotta put on enough weight. She could lose up to 30% of her weight during hibernation. Uh, and if she is to sustain a pregnancy and take care of the, the, uh, the cubs, she's going to have to have enough fat reserves to carry her over. Um, I think she has a pretty good chance. She's definitely put on a tremendous amount of weight. She doesn't look anywhere near like she did when she showed up, much darker, much fatter. So uh, we have to give her some kudos because she's done an excellent job. Um, Kim, what does the rest of the season look like? So as the summer comes to a close here um, in this area, we start to see the bears consuming more calories. They're consuming pretty much everything that they can in a last ditch effort to prepare themselves for the winter hibernation. Um, this is called hyperphagia, where they just keep eating and they never feel satiated. Um, as we start to dip further into fall, we're gonna see temperatures drop. Um, we're gonna see fewer, fewer sources available to the bears. And most rangers, um, including us, we have since moved from Brooks Camp over to King Salmon, with an exception of our maintenance team who are currently retreating and they're winterizing the buildings back at Brooks. Um, as we inch closer towards winter, the solar powered webcams are gonna start to fade. Um, both the bears and us rangers begin to hunker down and uh, Katmai just becomes this place of quietude and rest until next spring. Um, but we've got a little bit more time though, you know, before the bears begin to dig these dens and they huddle up for hibernation. So uh, back to you, Chris, can you tell us how, how do the bears know when it is time to turn it? Well, as you mentioned, the food has been decreasing and there are fewer and fewer salmon. You can see them at the falls occasionally uh, catching a silver or a coho, uh, nibbling on some snacks. 
Um, but sadly, these are few and far between. The scraps have either been consumed or swept down into the lake. Uh, the salmon have spawned, but being a big fan of salmon, I have to tell you, they will continue to add the nutrients like phosphorus and nitrogen to the entire ecosystem. But the lack of food combined with the lower temperatures and the shorter days are all triggers to have the um, bears start hibernation. Uh, but I know that Mike knows a lot about hibernation. Would you share that with us, Mike? Well, at least I pretend to. <laughs> so, uh, I, but I would love to share, you know, uh, some of the basics about hibernation. The, you know, the, the whole purpose of the bear's efforts to get fat are to prepare them for hibernation. And this is an annual phase when they don't eat or drink. They won't urinate or defecate. Bears hibernate to meet winter's challenges. And in doing so, they express some of the most remarkable survival adaptations among mammals. Before bears get to that point, they experience a long, slow transition. Hibernation isn't an on-off switch for bears. Although the metabolic slowdown has likely begun for many bears in Katmai, more than three weeks before a bear enters its den, its heart rate, body temperature, and overall activity begins to slow down. Just before a bear enters its den, its body temperature and heart rate decline sharply. And then that transition kind of continues. Those metabolic conditions don't bottom out for uh, several more weeks. And usually that happens in late fall or early winter, depending on when the bear went into hibernation. And when are they, when are they doing that? When are they going into their dens? To date, there haven't been any studies that have specifically tracked that in Katmai National Park, but we can make some educated guesses just based on studies in nearby areas. Most of Katmai's bears likely enter their dens in November, but there's quite a bit of variation. Some could enter the den as early as late October. Uh, on average, pregnant females and females with cubs enter the dens before other bears. Adult males usually enter their dens last and sometimes not until December. Where are they going though? Uh, that's also an important question. Although we don't know where the individual bears from Brooks River hibernate specifically, we know the habitat that they seek. It looks just like this. That's a steep hillside on Dumpling Mountain. Maybe hard to get a sense of scale, but there's two holes in the middle are old bear dens. Bears in Katmai dig dens on steep, well-drained and well-vegetated slopes in places that collect and hold a lot of snow. A steep slope allows a bear to dig straight into a hillside rather than down, so it lessens its workload. The roots of plants help stabilize the den's structure, and well-drained soils reduce the chance of the den flooding during a warm spell. And finally, snow insulates the den from cold winter air temperatures. Bears in Katmai are believed to dig a new den each year. The soils are too unstable for dens to last more than a year, and the bedrock doesn't support things like caves or other shelters that a bear could potentially use as a den. From Brooks River, the bears are traveling to nearby mountains to find a good den site. And, and the dens themselves are amazing places. I like exploring them if I'm lucky enough to stumble upon one in summertime, well after the bears, of course, have left their dens. But the real magic is, is what happens inside of the den itself. Uh, consider how a person can't survive more than a few weeks without food. Consider how we can't survive more than a few days without water. Consider how our muscles and bones need regular exercise to stay healthy. Consider how we need to excrete waste to rid our bodies of metabolic poisons. Now consider that hibernating bears don't need to do any of that stuff. When bears hibernate, they don't eat, they don't drink, they don't urinate, they don't defecate. Body fat provides the fuel that keeps a hibernating bear warm and the metabolic water that keeps them hydrated. Their kidneys are almost completely shut off, yet they're not poisoned by their metabolic waste. They recycle it into usable proteins to keep their muscles and organs healthy. They breathe only about one or two times a minute and their hearts beat maybe like eight or 10 times a minute, something like that. But really they're pumping so little blood and, uh, and carrying so little oxygen through their system that a human in the same condition would, would die, would just flat out die. And they can, uh, they can heal wounds and broken bones while experiencing hypothermia. They don't experience blood clots or bed sores or bone loss despite living as essentially bedridden animals for many months at a time. They become diabetic in late summer, but that condition reverses in hibernation. Uh, female bears give birth while hibernating and they lactate uh, to give their newborn cubs the food needed to grow and survive. So before I run out of breath, I think I want to stop there. The, the myriad uh, and amazing adaptations of hibernating bears is perhaps my 
favorite bear fact. I know some other rangers will agree that the hibernating bear is a truly remarkable creature. It's not the only thing uh, amazing about bears, though. And, and rangers at the park have some other favorite bear facts to share. My favorite fact about bears is that they hibernate. So to come out and eat all summer and gorge and be able to go sleep all winter is pretty amazing. That they can drop their heart rate to eight beats per minute and they can drop their body temperature to 10 degrees below normal in the summertime and sleep for a long time. It's really cool. There are so many cool things about bears and I guess this one makes sense, but I hadn't thought about it until somebody mentioned it, that bears have baby teeth. My favorite bear or salmon related fact is that there are so many salmon that wash up dead on the shores of Lake Naknek that their DNA can be found in the uh, trees. Before coming here, I did not realize that they could have white claws or different colored claws. Um, so that's one of my favorite facts about bears. Ooh, um, I think just how many there are. And then they're all here because of the fish, which is what really draws me here. Um, so just to see how productive for the habitat it is for bears and for really everything is pretty incredible. My favorite fact about bears is that when they are born, they weigh as much as a soup can. And then by the time they're full grown adults, they can weigh over a thousand pounds. My favorite fact about bears is that they also have personalities just like humans do, and they vary from bear to bear. The bears here are able to put on three to six pounds of fat every day. That they snorkel as a fishing method, which is super cool to watch. My favorite fact about bears is that they sploot sometimes when they lay on the beach, and it's very cute. My favorite fact about bears is that they're ecosystem engineers. Bears, when they carry all of their salmon that they eat, they drop it in all different places around the ecosystem. And that salmon nourishes the plant life around it. And so they're really shaping their ecosystem. They just are so cool. My favorite fact about bears is delayed implantation. I think it's so cool that they can mate in the spring and even to summer, and the embryos won't implant until the fall if and when they've gained sufficient fat reserves to make it through hibernation. So those were just some of our favorite facts about bears, but if you have a favorite fact about them, we would love to know what yours is and you can drop them in the comments below here and we can, uh, we can look over them later. But um, coming up next, let's look at what bears um, were like in the springtime. We'll go ahead and complete that cycle of what the year looks like for them. Um, so when it comes to spring, um, bears when they emerge from their winter hibernation, they're finding themselves in this landscape that is pretty sparse and it only has limited resources. Um, upon rising, initially they experience something that can be described as a walking hibernation where their uh, metabolic rate and their heart rate runs slower for about the first two weeks. Um, but once their bodies have kicked back up to speed, they will find themselves foraging for resources in order just to bide time before the salmon migration begins again. Um, during the spring, um, bears are eating grasses, they're eating sedges, um, overwintered berries. As we know, bears can lose up to one third of their body weight during hibernation. So any of these foods that they find are very crucial to sustain them. And bears are omnivores, so whatever they find, they will definitely take the opportunity. Um, this is going to be just a very challenging season for bears in general, um, and it all comes down to how fruitful the landscape is, and more importantly, how well fed they were prior to going into their dens. This is why we're seeing bears like 747 looking already huge, um, you know, when emerging in the early summer. He's just still carrying some of his weight from his success um, in the summer before. So, which brings us back to this year's competition with 747, whose tactic of rolling over his fat reserves made him one of the largest and most successful bears out there this season and got him into the finale. While 901 also put in a lot of hard work, um, she gained all of her weight during this single summer, which is really impressive if you look at how large of a bear she is. Um, there are various methods that bears um, can put into uh, to to find their success. Um, and on this page of success in general, Leon, can we take a look at 
just some of our previous Fat Beer winners and how they found their success both out there, but also in this competition. Sure. Um, you know, t thinking about today, we have come so far. And so let's take a quick look back to where it all started. You know, Fat Bear Week started merely as a single day event in 2014 on our Facebook page alone. And there's that original bracket there. And that day we had 1,693 votes and our first Fat Bear winner was crowned. That was 480 Otis. And you know, he won by a mere margin of 38 votes against 410, um, a bear who's no longer seen at Brooks. But for those who knew her before, she was an incredibly large bear, um, also known for napping and orchestrating very long bear jams. Um, but she was also one of my favorite bears when I was a seasonal back in 2017 as well. Um, but moving on throughout the years, you know, since then we have crowned several more Fat Bear Week champions. Uh, in 2015, we had 409 Bead Nose. 2016, 480 Otis again. 2017, Otis repeat. Um, 2018, Bead Nose back again. And 2019, 435 Holly. 2020, 747, and he won by quite a margin, I do believe, in that one. Um, and 2021, just last year, 480 Otis back for the four peat. Um, but as for this year, you know, there is still time on that clock. And Chris, what message do you have for people with our countdown to the close of Fat Bear Week here? This is your last chance to be a part of what appears to be a record breaking uh, Fat Bear Week. So as Leon said, you still have time to go to www.fatbearweek.org. Um, you have until 9 p.m. Eastern, 5 o'clock Alaska time to, to get that vote in. Um, every vote counts. Um, so take a few minutes and make sure that you've picked your bear and see how it comes out at 9 o'clock. I'm looking forward to the final tally coming up in about an hour and a half and i think we broke a million votes in fat bear week this year which is which is remarkable thanks everybody who did participate and vote uh, i was hoping for a million votes this year and it's much more than that i think if we included all the fat bear junior stuff so that's really incredible to see people from all over the world engaging uh, with a uh, cat mice bears and as we conclude fat bear week uh there's another important event that i want to announce because today starts the mark or today marks the start excuse me, of the Otis Matching Fund, named after, of course, uh, many people's favorite brown bear, number 480 Otis. This benefits the Katmai Conservancy, which is the official nonprofit partner of Katmai National Park. And I'm pleased to be a volunteer member of its board of directors. The, Conservanc the Conservancy supports the preservation of Katmai by promoting uh, public interest in it, appreciation and support of the park. We uh, work to do that through education, interpretation and uh, research. Through October 15, you'll have three ways to contribute to the Otis Fund. So you can do that directly on the Katmai Conservancy's website, uh, which is katmaiconservancy.org. You can go to explore.org's Facebook page and find a donation button there. And then also on uh, the Brooks Falls YouTube channel uh, or excuse me, stream uh, for explore.org. So if you're watching on YouTube, you probably know where that is. And uh, we'll also post links to those in the comments so you can find those easily. Uh, your donations to the Otis Fund will be matched by explore.org up to $50,000. And the final matched total will be announced during a live event with the Katmai Conservancy this Saturday, October 15 at 4 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Pacific. Join us for that. It'll be a fun celebration. And uh, of course, uh, any donation is welcome. But no matter if you can afford to donate to the Otis Fund or not, you can still be a champion uh, for Katmai's Bears, the cause of healthy salmon runs, uh, but, and by supporting efforts to protect their habitat, by talking to people about this amazing place, and by electing people at all levels of government who support national parks and who will work to tackle the climate crisis and protect wild spaces. We covered uh, a lot of territory during the program today. And as we've discussed uh, after week, we've discussed its history. We've discussed how fat is important to the lives of brown bears, especially those two finalists. At the beginning though, I asked you to post a comment about which bear you are most like and why. 
we've selected a few of those comments and the writers of those will get a special 10th uh, anniversary bear cam mug from explore.org. Before I announce the winners of those, however, uh, the Rangers do have one final message to share. A21 because he loves to play. I guess Otis. Uh, Otis is very chill. Uh, he's very relaxing. Uh, you don't see him do much. Uh, if he had any human trait, he would probably be uh, an introvert like me. I think I am most like 854 Divot because she's a little derpy and I'm a lot derpy. Hmm. Um, whichever one's the fattest because I love to eat fish. The bear I'm most like, I think, is Grazer. Um, she's a protective mom, and I've been accused of that before. Uh, she takes very good care of her children. She teaches them what they need to know to take care of themselves in life, and, uh, and pretty much runs off anyone who tries to interfere with her and her family. I see a lot of bears napping on the beach, and I love naps, so I feel like I'm most like any of those bears. Probably 335 because when she sees a fish or sees a fish jump, she gets really excited. She starts bouncing on the bank and the whole bank bounces with her. That's me. I am most like Razor because I also do not take anything from anybody. I was watching one on the falls um, that was not successfully fishing. It was like standing on top of the falls and just like kind of patting at the water and um, there weren't any fish coming to him, and that's how I feel this season, because I got skunked usually with fishing. If I were a bear, I would be 435 Holly, because she likes to take a lot of really big naps on the beach after she eats a big meal, and I like taking naps, and plus she's huge. <laughs> hmm, tank cub, because I also enjoy eating <laughs> all the bears. And that was the answers from some of our rangers. But you know, Mike, I am really interested to hear what you have to say. Which bear are you most like? You know, I I, I knew you were going to ask me this, and I, I've been thinking about it like all day. Um, I I'd have to go with an introverted bear as well. Um, I, but you know, despite my chosen profession, uh, I like to spend a lot of time alone. So 820, I think, would be a good choice for me. He kind of like sticks against the far wall, just kind of like does his thing. Um, but even beyond that, I think I might go with one of those, those bears that we only see in like September and October, like shows up after the people disappear and just kind of like is, you know, just doesn't want to get involved in any mess with other bears. So I think I might choose one of those, you know, kind of mystery bears that we see maybe in very late summer overall. But that's a tough question. And I'm... Um, I, I'm eager to read what uh, people have chosen themselves uh, specifically, because again, at the beginning of the live broadcast today, we asked you to share you know, who, which bear you were most like to win a, uh, a fancy mug just like this. And we chose, it looks like eight winners out of um, the many that were submitted. It looks like there probably were like 50 or, or more uh, for them. So we'll just go through a few of these right now. Um, if you wanna contact us, uh, if you are chosen as a winner, write to feedback at explore.org for details about how to collect your mug. So first one up, uh, Otis, I may move slow, but I get things done. And that is exactly true. That's from N. Quail. Uh, uh, second on our list here, I may be like 901. I love napping on the beach. I'm totally in hyperphasia mode with a cub do in February. Oh, that is amazing. So that comes from Caitlin. And... Uh, Next one, I'm like Bear 610, living a solitary life out of the spotlight, surviving as best as I can. That comes from Ava. That is a, yeah, a great bear um, with a remarkable story. I am most like 89 Backpack because I try to avoid confrontational situations, but I'll stand up to adversity when necessary. That's BMD Dad. Yes, Backpack, he is also a wonderful bear to watch and admire. Bumblebee Bat says, I'd say I'm most like 747. I too am short, chunky, enjoy food, slightly cranky at times, and terrified of Grazer. Uh, well, aren't we all? 
Uh, M. Chez writes, uh, 128 Grazer, I put on weight while raising my family. Also, my ears, they are really fluffy and bright. Well, uh, <laughs> you maybe have some pretty, you must have some great bling on your ears then, M. Chez. Uh, I identified with 747. I rule through bulk, not through bullying. Plus, I have trouble climbing things. <laughs> so, yes, a great answer uh, there from Megascops, Osseo. And then finally, uh, last one here from Zen Master Otis, number nine, ten, the dancing queen, because sometimes I just have to dance and I don't care who is watching. Well, there are those are all wonderful and there are many others, too. I'm sorry we couldn't you know, give a mug away to everybody, um, but I'm, I'm very pleased to be able to read those in some of the other submissions. So thanks for everyone who who shared their thoughts on which bear they are um, and why. Uh, Rangers, you know, I want to I want to thank you for, um, you know, helping with Fat Bear Week this year, because I know it was a ton of work for you uh, to do so. So this this event has been really fun, but it's also been really fun to work with you throughout the year. So thank you. Thanks, Mike. And, you know, we also could never do it without you as well. <laughs> it's been a pleasure, Mike. It's been a really fun season. I've had a good time learning from everybody. So thank you. The Fat Bear Week is an opportunity for us to consider the challenges that bears face in order to gain enough weight to survive winter. It also allows us to marvel at the success and the health of the productivity in Katmai's ecosystems. Uh, the two Fat Bear Week finalists this year, 747 and 901, are quintessential examples of success in the supreme adaptations that bears possess to survive. The sockeye salmon of Bristol Bay that support the bears are a, they, they represent a beacon of hope in a world that really is wounded uh, by mass extinction and, and climate change. So let's use them to remind ourselves that not all is lost. There's a lot to save everywhere and for everyone now in the future if we work to do so together. My name is Mike Fitz with explore.org. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks to the team at explore.org for helping with Fabry Week. Thanks to the Katmai Conservancy and thanks to, of course, the Rangers at Katmai National Park. Until I talk to you again, Enjoy the bears. Have a great night.